Another significant group in late Second Temple Judaism is known as the Essenes. This is the group that produces the famous Dead Sea Scrolls, rediscovered in the 1940s. These scrolls are crucial for modern scholarship because they reveal the Palestinian and Jewish roots of Christianity. We also see, very interestingly, that Judaism was already being influenced by Greek culture and Greek ideas even before Christianity. So in some sense, Judaism has already been Hellenized or been affected by that larger Greek culture. We also see in the writings of the Essenes their modes of worship. We see them use ritual purification by water, evocative of the Christian practice of baptism. And we see that they have the conviction of being a new covenant and the true Israel. Again, ideas that will also be the case within Christianity. The Essenes are so crucial to us because they establish a library of scrolls. Remember that books are not really in use yet, and so scrolls are the way that you record your writings and record the scriptures. And it is from their writings that we receive the oldest surviving copies of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, before the discovery of the, uh, the Essenes texts, our oldest texts were in fact medieval, the Masoretic texts in Hebrew. Um, and what's interesting is that there are very few deviations between the medieval Masoretic texts and those of the Essenes. That suggests that uh, the scriptures had been copied fairly faithfully over hundreds of years, although there are some differences and that's an area of important study. Uh, we also find, though, among the writings of the Essenes, apocryphal works revealing uh, the popularity of apocryphal points of view in Jesus' day, and also pseudepigrapha, so other books that are presented as having been written by great figures of the Jewish past. We also see in the Essenes' use of scripture similar methods of interpretation that are found in the New Testament, such as typology. Some suggested that the, or do suggest that the Essenes lived something of a monastic existence at Qumran, um, and that certainly is possible, although there's some controversy over those findings. They may have been founded when the Hasmoneans usurped the office of the high priest. The idea here would be that the Essenes objected to the leadership of the temple, felt it was illegitimate, and therefore withdraw to await now two messiahs. Now, think about the significance of this. These are pious Jews devoted to the temple. So this is a big step for them to isolate themselves from the temple. But it is because of that conviction that the temple is no longer legitimate, or at least its leadership is not. And now they go off to purify or make themselves holy in advance of what they expect will be the intervention of God and the restoration of them to the temple and to Jerusalem. Um, and in order to provide for their life, we see that among their writings, they have a manual of discipline. And here we begin to see links between uh, the writings of Qumran and some of the language that we find in the New Testament, such as that of John, the Gospel of John, where we hear language, dualistic language, speaking of the children of the light and of the darkness. The Essenes also spoke of messianic ideas and spoke of something of a banquet, uh, or use banquet imagery, again, linking it with some of the New Testament Christian ideas. We have examples of their hymns that they sang, their liturgic, uh, some books that reveal liturgical fragments, and there are questions about whether there may have been a link between the ministry of John the Baptist and the Essenes, although that remains rather speculative. There's also what the New Testament calls the Zealots, or what Josephus calls the Fourth Philosophy. This is a group certainly with messianic expectations. And these are really revolutionaries, people who want to oppose or even overthrow the Roman occupation of Israel. Although, be careful, uh, these are not really political people, because in this sense, the revolution is a religious revolution. It's an attempt for religious reasons to drive out the Romans and purify the land. Uh, some propose that the Zealots were not, in fact, an organized group, at least not until later during the Jewish revolts, uh, but rather simply anyone who's zealous for God's law, although we'll see that there are some new findings with regard to that. Um, among the zealots, you'd find groups like the Sikari, who are uh, uh, really a cult of assassins who try to assassinate those who work with the Romans or pick off vulnerable Romans when they're alone. These are folks who want to purify the land of foreign influence, to purify the temple and the people. 
So they're not only enemies of the Romans, they were enemies of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem and enemies of all those Jews they might see as being less than Jewish. Just before and during the first Jewish war against Rome, the Zealots become really a nationalistic revolutionary party. They come out of the uh, shadows in a sense and they engage in direct battle with the Romans uh, with a rather unhappy result. One of Jesus' apostles is called Simon the Zealot in Luke and Acts. Uh, despite what I've just said, N.T. Wright argues that the Zealots are in fact really a branch of Phariseeism following the teachings of the Rabbi Shammai, rather than a mainstream Pharisaical teacher by the name of Hillel. Um, and I think Wright makes a good argument, we may look at that argument later in the semester. In Jesus' day, there's also a group known as the Samaritans, viewed as alien by the Jews, who worship on Mount Gerizim in the north and accept only the Mosaic Torah, and none of the prophets or writings. They are viewed fairly favorably in the New Testament, suggesting that some of them were early converts, and they do survive today. They're really the remnant of the destruction of the north in 722 by the Assyrians. Um, remember that the Assyrians exiled the leadership of the people, but they left some of the peasants and then settled foreigners, and the two groups mixed, again making them abhorrent to uh, other Jews. They're closely related to Jews, and yet they seem foreign as well, making it almost worse than being truly foreign. Uh, so there's a tremendous animosity in Jesus' day between uh, Jews and Samaritans. And finally we have the Christian perspective, which is going to have to answer those same questions about the gap that exists between God's promises and the realities of the people. And of course the Christians are going to see Jesus himself as the fulfillment and the bridging of that gap. So Jesus fulfills the temple, we'll see in John. Jesus fulfills the promise of the land, uh, really with the kingdom of God. Jesus fulfills the vocation of Israel itself to bring the blessing of God to the nations. Uh, we see in him now the nations coming to faith. Jesus is the intervention of God that the people have awaited, and Jesus ultimately is the bridging of the gap that opens between God and man in Genesis. So the Christians face the same problem, but come up with a very different response, one that is entirely unexpected, but that has a logic of its own.